Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is a stratovolcano located in Skamania County, Washington. This volcano is best known for its huge and disastrous eruption on May 18, 1980. This photograph comes from photographer Robert Landsberg, who of course was in the area at the time of the eruption. Before the eruption, he had visited the area in order to photograph and document all of the changes that were happening. On May 18th, he was within a few miles of the volcano when it erupted. Since he unfortunately was located so close to the explosion, he knew he would be unable to escape this disaster, so instead of focusing on the impossible, he focused on taking as many pictures as possible. Robert was obviously incredibly brave and dedicated, but also very smart. After snapping as many photos as he could, including this one, he then secured his camera in his backpack and covered his backpack with his body. He knew he was unlikely to survive, but wanted to make sure that these photos did. His body was found 17 days later with his backpack still underneath him. His film was of course, um, his film was of course developed and has provided geologists with some really valuable insights with his close documentation of the eruption. In our number 9 spot today we have the core. This photo shows a physicist named Harold Agnew, and while this looks like a relatively normal, non-threatening photo, what he has in his hand is truly devastating. Harold is holding the nuclear core of what was nicknamed the Fat Man Atomic Bomb. This means that Harold is holding the nuclear core of the atomic bomb that was later dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. The immediate blast of course took many lives, but so did the long term effects of the bomb, like radiation illness and that sort of thing. It's crazy to look at a photo like this because it seems just so perfectly normal when he literally has a life changing, world ending device in the palm of his hand. Also, I don't think I could ever hold something like that. Not only would I just like not want to, but I would just be so afraid that something was gonna go wrong. In our number 8 spot today we have the Challenger crew. This is a photo that was taken of the clearly very excited Challenger crew as they walked down the ramp ready to head off on their mission. The crew even included 37 year old Krista McAuliffe who was a high school social studies teacher. She had won a spot on this mission through a program with NASA called the Teacher in Space program and she had trained diligently for months in order to be the first non-military person in space. On January 28, 1986, the Challenger mission proved to be fatal just 73 seconds after liftoff. Two rubber O-rings failed because of the cold temperatures of the morning and on live television the world watched as the spacecraft broke apart and plunged into the ocean, sadly taking the lives of everyone on board. It is an absolutely tragic event made even more chilling by this final photo. Number 7 Mummies for Sale Considering the frenzy that people get into when archaeologists discover a new mummy, you might be surprised to learn that this picture is actually a street merchant selling mummy merchandise of actual actual mummy. During the Victorian era in the 1800s, Napoleon's conquest opened the gates of Egypt to the Europeans, making mummies a really hot commodity. Like imagine somebody bury like uh, uncovering your aunt and going, "Ooh, we could sell her." Weird, right? Like 1000 years from now, they could be purchased from street vendors just as you see from this photo. The Euro elite used to even have mummy unwrapping parties, which is exactly as it sounds and not what you would expect people to do with a corpse. But even weirder than that, people actually thought ground up mummies had medicinal properties. It was so popular that it even instigated a counterfeit trade to meet the massive demand for magic mummy ground stuff. What did the counterfeit trade involve? The flesh of beggars instead of mummies. All that behind one picture. In our number 6 spot today we have the elephant's foot. This photo looks like it's just a big lump of nothing but it's called an elephant's foot. Don't worry at first I was a little worried too, but it has nothing to do with elephants and is only named that because of its appearance. This lump was actually created from the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown and it is just a mass of corium and other materials that were in the core of the reactor. This elephant's foot was located in the steam distribution corridor which is under what's left of the reactor. While this mass doesn't produce as much radiation as it did before, it does still to this day produce a deadly amount. It is said that if you stood in front of it for just 300 seconds, that would be enough to get a lethal dose of radiation. It's kind of crazy that even though they knew this, they were still standing there taking pictures of it. But I'm just glad because we all now get to see it and it gives us just a little more insight into what exactly happened that day. 
Number five, Skunk Ape. This one is exactly what it sounds like. The Skunk Ape was seen back in 2000, so hopefully, if it's a real thing, it's long gone. Hopefully it's dead by now, it's pretty gross. Two photos were taken of the supposed Skunk Ape, and this thing looks like Bigfoot's cooler, older cousin. You know, that cousin who has a lava lamp, does kick flips in the garage in October, that kind of cousin, that's the skunk game, really. An anonymous source sent the Sarasota County Sheriff's Department these photos. They mailed them in, which for starters, that's pretty jarring to receive. Just a creature, just a big foot, put it in the mail. But she claims these photos were taken in her actual backyard and that this creature was not a black bear. It wasn't anything we've seen before. I personally don't think that's a black bear. If anything, it's just a really large, odd looking dog. Those teeth alone are a red flag either way. I want nothing to do with that. In our number four spot today we have the Pioneer's Defense. This photo is known as the Pioneer's Defense and man does it ever look creepy. This photo comes from 1937 and it was taken by a Russian photographer named Viktor Bulla. This photo takes place in the Leningrad area which is now known as St. Petersburg which is the second largest city in Russia. The people in this photo were part of a group that was the 1930s Russian equivalent of our Boy Scouts and it was called the Young pioneers. The masks on their faces leave a very eerie feeling and for a fair reason. These people were doing a military preparation drill, which is the reason for the gas masks. This photo was taken during a time where the country was under the dictatorship of Joseph Stalin and the residents were constantly unsure of what was going to happen. The country was already seeing death and people were already frightened just a few years before the start of World War II. Number three, Spaceman. Look, we've all been photobombed before. It's a blessing in disguise. You look back at prom photos. Some dude's trying to do a moonwalk in between, his face is like melting this way. It's great, you're like, ah, classic Jeff. It's the best. But when Jim Templeton took a photo of his daughter in a otherwise empty marsh long before Photoshop existed, and yet somehow there appears to be an astronaut in the background, well, that's not very fun, is it? That's a little bit concerning. Jim assures us that nobody was around when this photo was taken, which I of course believe, because why would you put your kid in a photo with whatever that is. That's, no, no thank you, it's not a weird, we're not gonna go and talk to that guy. Also, the fact that this man looks like he's from space. That ought to do it, that makes him more weird and believable. What are we looking at right now? I have no idea. Kodak even got involved in the story, like, Kodak. Not Kodak Black, like the company, they got involved. They confirmed this photo was not tampered with. Yeah, and that's Kodak, right? They don't lie about anything. Spider-Man leak, Kodak's like, nah, it's Andrew Garfield. Don't listen to that. So authentic, can confirm. In our number two spot today, we have the acid drum. This photo comes to us from inside the house of another terrible person, the serial killer, Jeffrey Dahmer, made very famous recently. This photo was taken from the inside of his home after he was found out and caught by authorities. Before his arrest, he was sadly able to take the lives of 17 different people. Although this photo might look kind of plain, the horrors are plentiful. This shot shows a drum full of acid that was located inside of his home. Probably don't really need to tell you what it was used for. I can't imagine the horrors investigators saw when they entered his home, and even previous to that as they investigated his crimes. Thankfully, Jeffrey was caught, and in 1992, he was sentenced to life in prison, but just two years later, he was killed by a fellow prison inmate. In our number one spot today, we have the Dyatlov Pass incident. If you have never heard of the Dyatlov Pass incident, you better buckle in because it is so terrifying. This photo was taken in February of 1959 as nine young Soviet hikers sent out to trek through the Ural Mountains. They had set up a camp and sometime during the night, something happened that made them cut their way out of the tent and all flee the site. Leaving in such a rush, they were of course underdressed for the bitterly cold weather and six of them ended up passing away from hypothermia which is extremely tragic. The other three however is where this story takes an even more frightening turn. Like I mentioned before, no one knows why they fled the tent in the first place and the last three hikers were found passed away with severe signs of physical trauma that no one agreed on what had caused it. In 2019 the investigation was reopened and just last year there was a conclusion that a kind of avalanche called a slab avalanche was the cause for these injuries. Before you come at me in the comments, I know that not everyone is convinced that's what happened and I don't blame you. It's really strange. So down below in the comments, let me know what you think. Let's solve this mystery once and for all together in the YouTube comments.
Regardless of what happened, this whole incident was of course very tragic, but the mystery behind it definitely takes it to a very spooky place. Number 10, the isolator. The last thing anybody wants to do after the almost, almost two years we've had? Ugh. Though this looks like an object perfect for deep sea diving, it was actually built for desk work. Hugo Gernsback was a Luxembourgish American inventor, writer, editor, engineer, designer, businessman, and of course, magazine publisher, because why not add one more thing to the list he's really good at? He started a magazine called Science and Invention, which encouraged scientific and amateur experimentation. This was one of the inventions published in the magazine and was revealed in July 1925. The main purpose was to block out all of the noise from the surrounding environment, narrow the field of view like horse blinders to improve concentration. But don't worry, there was an oxygen tube attached to help out the studier, so you you know you could you could breathe while you're reading about Shakespeare or something. Number nine, kangaroo boxing. Link here. This next one looks pretty self-explanatory, but also it's very confusing at the exact same time. Kangaroo boxing actually became pretty popular in the 1800s. In both Europe and the United States, clowns and professional boxers would square off against marsupials in front of herds of people. It was actually started by a university professor just like as a joke and then it really caught on. Who they cheered for? One can't be certain. The man in the above photograph was sparring against a kangaroo in Germany in 1924. Obviously, the sport did not continue as it was considered abusive to animals who clearly had no idea why this hairless being was all up in their space and trying to beat them up. I don't understand. This is just ridiculous. Number eight, children shipped in the mail. Picture here. Sounds ridiculous is ridiculous. But did it happen? Of course it did. However, this picture was actually staged, but this actually did happen. Imagine your sister calling you and telling you your nephew is visiting, and then minutes later the doorbell rings and your nephew is just like chilling with some packing peanuts in a cardboard box. Well, not quite. The postman had to play a kind of babysitter a bit. Shortly after package delivery, a revolutionary thing on its own, was introduced, a couple in Ohio sent their infant son to their grandmother's via post in 1913. It cost 15 cents plus $50 insurance. Once this oddball story got out, the trend caught on. Regulations were vague about what you could and could not send via post, so why take a bus when you could take a postman? Rural townships also usually knew their postman really well, so they'd be like, oh come on Joey, here's 15 cents, take little Timmy to my aunts, I don't know. So they trusted them, they weren't just passing them off to strangers. However, eventually new regulations came out banning the practice, finally, because it's just weird. <laughs> In our number seven spot today, we have the plague. This photo comes from the 19th century, from the third plague pandemic. This was the first time that the plague had spread to all five continents. While we now know something about what that might have been like, what we haven't had to endure are the doctors that dressed like this. This is a photo of the outfits and masks that plague doctors wore when they would come to your house to treat or diagnose you. The long beak-like noses of the masks are very creepy, but they were used to hold herbs and other nicely scented things because they believed that it would help ward off the bad air, which at the time is what they thought was causing the sickness. A pandemic certainly is bad enough. Thankfully, our doctors and nurses are just sticking to scrubs. Number six, half and half. This next one actually has a kind of sad story behind it, but paints a very clear picture of the division between Catholics and Protestants and actually just religion in general. This picture depicts two graves in the Netherlands, one belonging to a Protestant and the other a Catholic. In 1842, a 22-year-old Catholic noblewoman fell passionately in love with a 33-year-old commoner, a colonel in the cavalry who was also Protestant, a big no-no. Their marriage was a total scandal, but they said screw you to their peers and stayed together for 40 years. The woman's husband died in 1880 and to forever unite them, she built a grave that would forever keep them together even though they were apart by a wall. The old cemetery was strictly divided into Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish sections, so these two monuments were built so they could forever be together. Does anybody have a tissue? Number five, Laskow Cave. If you didn't visit this cave back in 1963 or sooner, well, you lost your chance because, well, humans ruin everything. Now we can't even see ancient art anymore because, well, 
It's too many of us. The last caught cave system is now a World Heritage Site in France, but once it was a booming tourist attraction. These cave paintings, see, they're 17,300 years old. They're quite ancient. We can't really touch them. You can't have someone write Steve was here on it. Can't do that. Paintings that depict cattle, bison, stags, you name it. They're beautiful. They're complex. And of course, like I said, they're extremely old. So old, in fact, that the cave was closed to the public forever in 1963 after it declared human presence wasn't healthy for the art. Yeah, our dirty coffee breath would eventually cause this art to fade away. So we had to hold our breath. We gotta leave. We gotta close it off. There we go. Plus, I'm sure somebody would have snuck in with a Sharpie by now and ruined it. You know what I mean? Or like graffiti. It would have been gone by now. You know it. 7,000 year old paintings. Yeah, protect these for another 17,000 years, please. Number four, Walter Yeo. Though the picture itself is a little disturbing, it signifies a life changing moment for Mr. Walter Yeo and also for thousands more. This was one of the world's first plastic surgery procedures. Walter Yeo had suffered a dreadful accident while manning the guns on the HMS War Spite during World War I. He lost both his upper and lower eyelids in the event. A year later, however, he met Sir Harold Gillies, who would be considered the father of plastic surgery. His idea was to take skin from another part of Yeo's body and place it over the area in like a mask like shape, as you can see in the photo. Dr. Gillies then went on to carry out the surgery on 5,000 injured men from June. 1917 onward. And thanks to his work, thousands of people have benefited since the years of the war. Yeo himself lived until he was 70 years old. Number three, Warstead Church Visitor. Okay, time to get a little paranormal. We love those. Hit the lights. Back in 1975, Peter and Diane Berthelot were visiting the Warstead Church in the UK. It was beautiful, right? So like any visitor does, Peter took a photo with his nice Kodak camera, right? He wants to see the truth with his Kodak. Peter took a photo of his lovely wife sitting in this spectacle of a church, but later on, once the photo was developed, somebody else was all of a sudden in the photo now. Or something, we don't really know. Right on the bench behind Diane, there appears to be a person in all white. How calming is that? Maybe it's a wedding, maybe it's their big day. We love it. When the couple went back to the church to ask about who it was, a local suggested they may have gotten photo proof of the white lady, the spirit of a healer who haunts the church. I mean, as far as surprise ghosts go, that's pretty tame. That's a pretty tame encounter. That's how it should be. Could have been a lot worse. They're like, oh, that's the demon. That's Daryl the demon, yeah. You don't want any part of that. Number two, the Hindenburg disaster. Based off the title, you already know that this is a picture of the Hindenburg disaster because I already said it. Spoiler alert. The Hindenburg was the largest dirigible ever built and it was the pride of World War II. Yeah, see, Germany, you know which one I'm talking about. The, but YouTube gets mad. The first successful airship was constructed in 1852 by Henry Giffard, but the problem was he used hydrogen. This made both French and German designs of the craft susceptible to explosions if something went wrong. Hence, exhibit A. What you are seeing in the photo is the direct aftermath of a devastating accident. Um, on May 6, 1937, the dirigible touched a mooring mast in Lakehurst, New Jersey, sparking the explosion, which took the lives of 13 passengers and 21 crew members. Something as simple as a small spark from the engine ignited the hydrogen core, and the craft fell 200 feet to the ground in flames. And last but not least, number one, spectators. This is the photo taken at the trial of Al Capone. Yeah, it suddenly makes a lot of sense as to why people are covering their faces. When someone says to you 1930s gangster, Al Capone probably jumps into your head. He was deemed public enemy number one by the US government for bootlegging and other illegal rackets during prohibition. The terror the ruthless gangster incited in the city of Chicago is evident by this image. Witnesses and spectators of the trial covered their faces so they wouldn't be recognized by Capone's vengeful accomplices or Capone himself. Behind those fedoras may lie other criminals yet to be unmasked or civilians scared of a Tommy gun waking them up at night. Either way, you know he must have been one terrifying dude. Authorities did everything they could to catch him but he would always slip right through their fingers. Finally, his reign came to an end in 1931 when they caught him on income tax evasions of all things that landed him an eight year sentence. Number 10, Russian Bigfoot caught on tape. The exact location of where this video was taken is still unknown. In fact, there isn't a ton known about this video at all, but what is known is that it was taken somewhere in Russia. That's about it. And people actually believe that it captures the real Bigfoot or one of the many Bigfoots out there. This is the Russian one. They got a Russian Bigfoot. What do we all think here? I wanted to 
start with one of the most insane videos I could find. I think I nailed it. How'd I do? I don't know. This one comment dives in further. The user says, the title of the original video was called Chichuna, but in Russian script. The creature hops, sometimes sideways like a lemur. Of course, lemurs have tails, which make that type of movement easier. And Chichunas are sometimes described as having tails, but this creature doesn't appear to have one, does it? No, it looks like a, a blob of scariness. I don't even know. The original footage was in all Russian and claimed to have been shot in Siberia. It also featured a boy and a dog in the foreground who didn't appear to be all that concerned, but I still believe this footage to be genuine. That's one of the top comments, so. You know, if someone did their research. Number nine, overnight visitor. Oh, this one definitely gives me the chills. I don't like it. This video was taken from a surveillance camera that was placed inside of a couple's home. Not outside, inside. This is scary. And this, I hope this never happens to anybody watching this video. The footage caught something while they were both asleep. And it's one of the creepiest things that I've ever seen. When the couple woke up the next day, they were unable to find a purse that they knew was in the home right before they went to sleep. So they decided to check their security cameras and this is what they found. As they were sleeping, a man crept in and was so quiet that he didn't wake them or their dogs up. No, he stood at the top of the stairs watching them sleep for a few minutes, which just adds another layer of Ew, to this whole scenario. Yeah, always check those nooks and crannies before you go to sleep, I guess. Number eight, Titanic inspection card. This inspection card once belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. What could possibly be creepy about an inspection card, you ask? Well, it shows how Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers that went down with the ship. Now, the card shows that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic. For some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed, and she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. Yeah, you can see the word majestic is literally crossed out of her card. You know, adds to the creepy element because it shows her literal change in plans. Number seven, Gloria Steinem. Oh, here we go, a scandalous one. Back in 1963, the Playboy Club in New York City was booming. It was one of Hugh Hefner's greatest accomplishments at the time. This club was the talk of the town. That is until Gloria Steinem came in and started reporting some stuff. Gloria was a feminist, writer. She's an icon. She created Miss Magazine back in 1972, but her career began much earlier around the 60s. See, she got a job as one of these Playboy bunnies, you know, must be a comfortable getup. And she worked at the club undercover, secretly taking note on how this key holders only <sighs> establishment was operating, right? Cool. What's going on in here? What's the big scoop here? The staff were these young women, these beautiful young women, these bunnies. They had to wear the black bodysuits, the puffy white tails, the whole get up. And at age 28, Gloria worked undercover there for three weeks straight. And the piece she released after, appropriately titled A Bunny's Tale, Great title, by the way, she nailed that one. It got so much attention that it kickstarted her freelance career and also made her a feminist icon. This photo of Gloria undercover shows you the comfortable work outfits she had to endure just to get the story out. Yeah, doesn't look like she had her non-slips on there. That's, that's a write-up in my books. In a collection of her writings, Gloria reflects on the undercover piece, saying that it now has outlived all of the Playboy clubs, both here and abroad. That was before Hefner passed away in 2017, so I will add that you also outlived him as well. Good, he wasn't a very nice lad. Let's move on. Number six, the cool time traveler. Do you believe in time travel? If your answer is no, maybe this next one, maybe it'll change your mind or keep you open to the concept. It's a common theme in movies, Back to the Future, Loopers, Avengers. Time travel plots are fun, but they're absolute nonsense. Or are they? When we see a case like the Cape Scott story, we can't help but be intrigued a little bit. Time travel or not, this is an interesting photo. It comes from Ray Peterson's book, The Great Cape Scott Story. That book was from 1974, but the actual photo used in the book was taken over 100 years ago. And in the photo, it shows this modern looking guy rocking shorts, maybe jorts, who knows? He has messy morning surfer hair, dippity do, three hold, you know, that kind of stuff. He doesn't look like he's from that time period at all. This also has happened more than once, like the time traveling hipster. I don't know, I'm pretty sure it's my cousin. That looks like a guy I know. Definitely not a guy from the 1900s, that's for sure. In our number five spot today, we have Mount Pinatubo. This is a photo that is showing Mount Pinatubo, which is located in the Philippines on June 15th, 1991. That is the day that this volcano erupted into what would be the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Certainly impressive, also extremely terrifying. This photo shows the pyroclastic flow full of hot gas and rock being flung into the air. Eruptive activity in the volcano first started on April 2nd, 
end of that year, which prompted researchers to set up seismographs in the area. By June, the volcano was having a group of progressively shallower eruptions before, on June 12th, the volcano had its first spectacular eruption, which sent an ash column 19 kilometers up into the atmosphere. After more highly gas-charged magma reached the surface on June 15th, the volcano once again exploded, this time sending the cloud of ash 40 kilometers up into the atmosphere. Volcanic ash and pumice blanketed the surrounding area, and pyroclastic flows filled what were once deep valleys with fresh volcanic deposits. It was truly magnificent and extremely powerful, and this photo shows just that. Number four. Solway Spaceman caught on photo. Look, we've all been photobombed before. It's a blessing in disguise. You look back at prom photos, some dude sneezing in the background while you're, you know, having the moment of your life. It's the best. We love it. But when Jim Templeton took a photo of his daughter in an otherwise empty marsh, long before Photoshop existed, it appears an astronaut just crashed the family moment. He just had to pop up in the photo in the background. Now, Jim assures us that nobody was around, which I believe, otherwise, what a weird photo to take in an empty field. I'd be like, hi, get away from my daughter. Just, yeah, 17 meters to the left, thanks. Also, the fact that this man looks like he's from space. Yeah, that makes it more believable, no? What are we looking at right now? Who is this? It's so, so creepy. Kodak even got involved in this story, right? Like Kodak, the company Kodak. They confirmed this photo was not tampered with. And they know everything. They made Avatar, so they know what's up. Let's run everything by Kodak from now on. Deal? Number three, the Dynosphere. The car of the future that really never made it there. And we can see why. Every car we have today has four wheels, not just one. Some have more than that now, it's getting confusing. But in the 1930s, J.H. Purvis had a vision. He called it the Dynosphere. It was a large wheel with a cabin in the center for the driver and the passenger to sit. Funny enough, it did actually work. Check this out. But did anyone else notice the problem with driving it? Yeah. You have to drive like Ace Ventura with his window open because it broke, you know what I mean that scene? Exactly. In order to see past the giant wheel spinning in front of you, you have to kind of rubber neck it out to the side. JH made two prototypes, one ran on gasoline and the other ran on electricity. He even designed a kind of bus version that could fit more passengers, but it still needed mini stabilizer wheels, so it had like six by the end of it. Do I kind of want one though, because it looks fun? Absolutely. Would I want to take it on a road trip across Canada? Absolutely not. Number two, Black Knight Satellite. Not to be confused with Martin Lawrence Black Knight, that's, you know, although that's pretty historical and memorable in itself, the Black Knight Satellite is something that has been orbiting our planet for God knows how long. We're guessing thousands of years. Everything else on this list is quite recent, but this myth is ancient. This photo here you've probably seen at one point or another. It was taken back in 1998 during an American mission to the International Space Station. Apparently this guy has been hovering over our Earth just watching us. It's some sort of alien satellite. That's a fun theory, no doubt about it. But during a spacewalk in 1998, one of the thermal covers came loose and drifted away from the station. Could this be that cover that just floated off and wrapped itself around a rock or something? Or it could be an ancient night satellite. One of the two. And finally, number one, the doorbell liquor. Nice, we gotta end with the weirdest thing I've ever seen. This one's short and sweet. Not much explaining to do here, obviously. Does what it says in the can. Back in 2019, a man was caught on surveillance, a doorbell camera, approaching a home in a neighborhood in Salinas, California. He doesn't say much, he just shows up. Doesn't drop off any package, nothing like that. He just shows up and uh, starts licking the doorbell. Not the camera, but the actual doorbell, like the button. He must have rang the bell hundreds of times because he did this for three hours straight. His jaw muscles must be insane. The homeowner said in a following interview after seeing said footage, uh, I quote, oh boy, that is just weird. Yeah, that's what they said to that footage for three hours of a man licking their doorbell. They're like, oh boy, that's weird. If that was me, I'd move. I'd be halfway packing. I'd be like, oh boy, that's weird. Grab a box, let's go. We're moving. Number 10, the cube. All right, Transformers fans, let's do this. I feel like we're hearing more about these things like UFOs or UAPs, whatever you wanna call them now. I feel like we're hearing about them now more than ever. So why not kick this weird list off with something off world? We have to include some alien cover-ups, right? It's me, it's Taylor, why not? I figured that I'd find one that's also not too well known. We haven't seen this one, you know, 
on YouTube all the time. Not too long ago, this spinning cube looking craft or drone or something, it was spotted over Missouri, just lurking in the same spot, just hovering. And then it would zoom off. Folks could see it with their naked eye on the ground. It was also pretty obvious. It was eye grabbing, it was shiny in the sky. Only a couple hours later, it was seen again, but this time it was 700 miles away. This time it was 44 year old Matthew Jandeka. He was minding his own business, hanging out on the porch, just doing his, you know, Sunday, Sunday stuff. When this cube, again, this floaty cube, caught his attention. It was a sunny day, the light reflecting off the cube caught his eye, but then a day later, another guy, 30 year old Justin Johnson, he saw the same thing. But this time he saw it while he was driving home, which is also pretty distracting. The light and the reflections also caught his eye. He says, at first I thought maybe it was a balloon, but the movements were too odd. In a world full of deep fakes, I mean, do we believe this account? Is this real? Lately everyone's talking about how these UFOs are spheres, so maybe this video is that of a sphere. Not a cube, that's cool. I love teaching geometric shapes via alien aircraft. I'm like, this is a triangle. We saw this one in the Navy. Then we saw this cube in the sky. Number nine, Amityville photo. Okay, we'll go less UFOs, more ghosts. One M. Night Shyamalan theme to the other. Here we go. This photo was taken inside the actual Amityville house back in 1976. It's a young man, it appears, with glowing white eyes. How comforting is that? Pretty, pretty hard to miss there, he's got the glowing Yep, yeah, looks very Sin City of him, just to stare with those white eyes. Now at first I thought this was from a horror movie, right? All those Amityville knockoffs. It looks obviously fake or set up in some way, until you start to read about the details here. See this photo, it was taken with automatic cameras equipped with infrared, not an actual person. So this young lad here probably wasn't expecting a selfie. Why I wasn't smiling or throwing up a peace sign. Makes sense now. Photographer Gene Campbell set up the photo and took it back in 1976. Now at the time, Gene was working with paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren on the actual case. Huh. I'm scared now. This photo was revealed three years after it was taken on the Merv Griffin show, and many believe this is the ghost of John DeFeo, one of the victims in 1974. Now, you can't really do this anymore, right? You can't whip out photos from a otherwise crime scene and be like, okay gang, what do we think? Spirit or not a spirit? Vote, yes, no. Obviously there was backlash after this for obvious reasons, but it took three years for that photo to reach the public eye, and now everybody believes in ghosts, or they do a little more than they did before that show. This was long before The Conjuring movie as well, obviously, so this was quite random to see on TV. Do you believe in ghosts? What's the ratio here? Comment down below. I'm not a believer, I'm not gonna lie. I've tried numerous times. I got the Ouija board, did the whole thing. Felt nothing, man. Like an 18 year old on Christmas. I'm like, is that it? Is it done? Do I have to feel anything anymore? Number eight, Alfred Hitchcock and the MGM Lion. All right, you're gonna hear me roar after this one. This photo was from 1958. You've seen this at some point, right? Hopefully, or else, you know, we'll send over a VHS, we'll help you out. It was taken by Clarence Sinclair Bull. Now the photo appears to be, well, no, it doesn't appear to be at all. It's Alfred Hitchcock serving tea to a lion. Yeah, the famous MGM lion. His name's Leo, that's him, there he goes, he's getting tea. He loves suspense and tea, who would have thought? And company, it appears. North by Northwest was the only film that Hitchcock did with MGM. So there's a rumor now that he directed the lion's roar for the MGM intro, which is fun. But you're also like, okay, that's a real animal, that's kinda, that's sad. And also, that's probably nonsense. There have been seven MGM lions in total. Yeah, not just one, but Leo was known to be the most friendly. I wanna hear about the other six. I'm like, what happened there? He's still in the logo today, but again, back in the 1950s, it's hard to say what it was really like on set. I mean, it's still a lion being held down for a photo, so probably wasn't a friendly vibe for that fella. Number seven, Norway lights. Natural light phenomena is common in our big, beautiful planet. The northern lights, the green flash, solar eclipses, you name it. I bet those were all pretty alarming back in ancient times. Now, some of these natural events look otherworldly. They look cosmic, almost. Most of the time, there's an explanation waiting, but for the mysterious glowing orbs floating over Norway, the Hausdellen lights, as locals call them, we still need some answers. Scientists have been trying to gather research, and in 2014, after many impressive light shows, their best guess is a natural battery that charges underground, and then emits this light show above. Maybe this has something to do with the uh, reoccurring lights over Phoenix. Could be the same phenomena happening, who knows. Number six, North Sentinel Island. 
All right, we got some people, some aliens, some ghosts. What else do we need, Taylor? How about some weird islands? Sure. North Sentinel Island. We gotta head over to India for this one. This island is the home of the Sentinelese tribe. You've probably heard about this at some point. One of the most forbidden islands in the world, but why? Located in the Bay of Bengal, North Sentinel Island is about 1,200 kilometers away from India. And while most islands are shrinking, this one actually grew back in 2014. Yeah, the universe is like, more. Yeah, you need more of this, sure. The island lifted up a couple of meters during an earthquake, so the west and south sides, they gained an extra kilometer. Nice. DLC unlocked. The inhabitants on this island are among the few uncontacted tribes left in the world. They have apparently been there for 50,000 years, and there's no sign of agriculture or even fire. Yet somehow this tribe has thrived for ages. Now, if we try and get close, they will try and drive anybody away. More than fair, like we have enough room, we're good. Let's just leave. In fact, back in 2006, two fishermen sadly lost their lives because they got too close to the island without knowing who was on it or what the island was. Yeah, you can't just approach random islands. You gotta do some homework. That's why I'm here. Number five, Leo the lion. Believe it or not, you've seen this lion before. In fact, you've probably seen him many times while watching your favorite films as a kid and even now. The lion in the photo is the one, the only, Leo the lion, the majestic beast who roars the MGM logo, like the old one. Leo the lion was the regular star of MGM since it was founded in 1924. The first MGM lion was called Slats, not Leo, and he actually didn't roar, he was just kind of like, looking around, it was more like a gif. But Leo is actually the most familiar roar, like everybody knows what he sounds like. But who is the man having tea with such a lion? Well that of course is Alfred Hitchcock, the king of thrills. This photo was taken in 1957 of the two legends posing to enjoy a hot cup of British tea. Number four. Surtsey Island, another fun island, another weird story. Here we go. When it comes to new things in life, it's pretty rare that we get a new island, right? Especially on our planet when we're losing things and melting. How lucky are we? Sure. We're even luckier that Disney didn't build a resort here first because now scientists, now they get a chance to study what an island looks like without human interaction. That's a fun little project to focus on in the future. That's cool. It's pretty cool. It's weird and scary, but it's cool, I guess. Yeah, kind of nervous. I don't know. Surtsey Island in Iceland, as of right now, it's only open to a few scientists and geologists. Everybody else, beat it. Go find your own island. Get out of here. It was born from a volcanic eruption back in 1963, and scientists, they have one rule on this island. Don't talk about Fight Club. And the second rule is no seeds. Yeah, no life, no chance at life at all. Choose something else, anything else, please. One guy accidentally pooped out a tomato seed and he almost ruined the whole operation. Guy almost ruined his entire plan. What a stressful job, it's so eerie to see the oldest human history and then immediately after see a new island where humans are forbidden. It's like, we're not allowed to go and be places anymore. I'm kind of uh, not, that's not great. What are we doing here? I'm just breathing on things, I can't take a sh this island. In our number three spot today, we have the lipstick. This is a photo that comes to us from December 10th, 1945. If looking at this image gives you a shudder down your spine, that absolutely makes sense as it was written by a terrible person known as the lipstick killer. This photo is an image of a note he left written on the wall at one of his crime scenes. The photo comes from the apartment of Francis Brown as just before he wrote this message, he took her life. After this message was left, he ended up taking the life of one other person before he was finally caught by police six months later. The message scrawled in the photo reads, quote, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. It is an absolutely chilling note with a horrifying backstory. Number two, nursing home spirit. This photo was taken from a nursing home resident the same night that another resident had passed away, which is an odd thing to do, just set up a camera thing right after, You're like, yeah, just in case, you know, maybe we'll catch one. Well, they did. This was back in 2015, and that night they heard a door open and close, but there were no visitors allowed at the time, so, you know, some, some Kodak was coming into the picture at this point. So now there's a great amount of people who think that this image is one of two things. It's either the spirit of the resident that passed away, or it's the Grim Reaper. Yeah, the door opening and closing, People think that was the Grim Reaper coming in and then leaving, which is so scary. How long was he in there? Was it like 46 seconds, four minutes? How long does this guy operate? Is he quick? Is it like busting tables? Is he just like, all right, let's do this. Is he like Santa Claus? I feel like he's like Santa Claus. A few comments were also saying that it's comforting, this photo, to know that in the end you aren't alone. 
that you have someone assisting you to the um, afterlife. No, I'm good. I'd rather die alone than have uh, whatever that is break into my home and closing open doors. I'm good. And finally, number one, the Battle of Los Angeles, or lack thereof. We'll see, I don't know, this is a weird one. Of course, we have to end on one of the most unspeakable battles, photos, whatever you wanna call it, of all time. The Battle of Los Angeles, otherwise known as the Great Los Angeles Air Raid, happened during World War II, right at the end of February 1942. Now, this event, first of all, took place only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack, so I'll admit, everyone's a little on edge. We're a little stressed out, we've got some hands hovering over some buttons, we're a little nervous. Sure, something like 25 enemy aircraft was apparently spotted flying over Los Angeles in the late hours of February 24th. So, air raids then went off, blackouts were put in effect. This was not a drill, right? Or was it? What was this? This thing was getting lit up in the sky. Around 1,400 shells were blasted off and two people had a heart attack. That's how loud it was. In total, five people ended up dying from this retaliation and apparently it was a false alarm. Although many now believe that it was UFOs or aliens and that's why we were launching stuff at it. A press conference was held by the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves. People have heart attacks. He's like, oops, I was nervous, my bad, slipped. A little quick reaction there. Kicking off our list at number 10. Floating hand. Okay, this one is so scary. Kill those lights, let's dive into it, right? This photo is from over 100 years ago. Now this time, the photographer may or may not have caught a floating spirit hand in their photo. Yeah, I'll show you the photo. Let me know if you see it at first, right? Take a glance. What? What's wrong with this photo? Anything sticking out? Any floating hands just, uh, appearing in the photo. This photo is a group of women who worked in a linen factory. The lady on the far right appears to have an extra hand resting on her shoulder. Yeah, her right, our left. This may be a hidden person, maybe somebody with long arms was out of frame. I'm a lanky guy myself. I can put my arms around like nine of my friends in a photo, I get it. But it's the positioning of the hand that gives me the chills, right? It looks curled almost, which gives it a demonic, insidious, the last key vibes. You know what I'm saying? Number nine. Colossal squid. Not to be confused with the giant squid, those are similar, but dare I say, smaller. Mm -hmm. As its name hit towards, the colossal squid is it's huge. It's one of the biggest things I've ever seen in my entire life. They live in the darkest, coldest depths surrounding the waters of Antarctica. These squid are on average 46 feet in length, with the females being the largest of the species. They have large tentacles with suckers equipped with razor hooks, so whatever it grabs, it's certainly not letting go anytime soon. Its diet consists of large fish, and when I say large, I'm referring to a seven foot long Pentagonian toothfish. You know, not like a little goldfish. No, these are colossal. They need a colossal meal. They try and fight whales sometimes. You know what I mean? They have no regard for the size of others, and they're more often than not marked up, suggesting that they've been in a few deep sea tussles, right? Octopus wants to fight. It's my favorite IPA. That's the inspiration right there. On top of being magnificent, they're quite mysterious. Only two specimens have ever been collected, with the second being as recent as 2014. Do you believe this is the closest living thing to the Kraken? I don't know, I'm horrified of deep sea creatures, so this list is haunting in my way, okay? Number eight, Island of the Dolls, Mexico. I'm also not a fan of dolls on islands, so pretty haunting. This island is famous, of course, for having dolls or doll parts just spread about all over. Why, you ask? Well, let's talk about it. The islands surrounding this one are inhabited, but this one is said to be filled with demonic spirits, so no one's hanging out, no one's camping, I guess. Specifically, the spirit of a young girl who drowned there way back, like Camp Crystal Lake, only creepier, dare I say. These dolls are hanging or nailed to the trees. Now the dolls have to come from somewhere, right? And they came from a local resident by the name of Julian Santa Barrera. He put all these doll parts up in order to try and ward away any demonic spirits, right? He's fighting back by nailing doll parts to a tree, I guess. that's. He's a hero. To this day, nobody dares to approach the island. They would much rather snap a photo from far away on their boat, which I totally agree with. That's probably a much better idea. If it didn't look haunted before, it definitely does now with the doll parts. I don't know, great call, Julian. Can it use smudge sticks though? I don't know. Doll parts, that's a bit. Number seven, the Lady of Raynham Hall. This one's a classic. If my grandma was still alive, she would have loved this one. If you haven't seen this photo, it's gonna live rent free in your head from here on out. This spirit is said to haunt Raynham Hall in Norfolk, England. Nice. 
my old home. Not Norfolk, but I have English family. What's up? This tale kicked off back in 1936 after a photo went around through Country Life magazine. I guess that's its way of going viral back then, right? This photo shows a spirit, apparently, wearing a brown gown. Hence where her name comes from, the Brown Lady of Raynham Hall. Just casually floating down a staircase. That's lovely. Imagine seeing this in real life. I'm sweating doing this list. Legend has it that the ghost is that of Dorothy Townshend. She was the sister of Robert Walpole, the first Prime Minister of Britain back in 1676. Some reports say the image is a result of long exposure, just gone awry, but you know, either way, I don't like looking at this photo. So let's move on. Great. Number six, Magnificent Alien. While the rest of the world was in panic mode, a new sea sponge was discovered in 2020. How fun is that? Now by fun, I mean, Definitely an alien, this is terrifying. It was named Advina Magnifica, which translates to magnificent alien. Yep, magnificent alien, they're gonna call it. This sponge literally gets its name because it looks like E.T. And to be fair, it does look like E.T., it's kinda cute. An ROV found this sample over 6,000 feet deep in the Pacific Ocean. This was never meant to be found, and we did it. They found it in what they call a forest of weird. Just an alien sponge sticking their E.T. heads out hoping for some food to pass by. That's literally their entire life. They just sit there and wait in the darkness until some sort of dust just sticks on them, and they go, let me eat it, somehow. Christiana Castella Branco, the researcher who found this deep sea squishy, explains the discovery in an NOAA interview saying, as all these organisms are intricately connected by documenting and describing marine biodiversity, we are building a better understanding of life and the impact of humans on Earth, and in this case, in the ocean, end quote. For a guy like me who doesn't like the ocean or any of the creatures in it. That's terrifying. See ya. Number five, the Perrin family. In 1952, Ed and Lorraine founded the New England Society for Psychic Research. They quickly gained notoriety after this next case, the Perrins. In 1971, the Perrin family, Carolyn, Roger, and their five daughters moved into a 14-room farmhouse in Rhode Island. At first, items started disappearing, then the ghostly sightings started. It was discovered that the home had some previous sinister owners. Self-emulation, freak accidents, and of course, murder in the attic. Whoever the spirit was, she perceived herself to be the mistress of the house, and she resented the competition my mother posed. The parents asked the Warrens to come in more than 10 separate times to help against this sinister, ghastly entity. During one seance, Carolyn was possessed, even rising from the ground while sitting in a chair. Andrea, the oldest daughter, said, My mother began to speak a language not of this world in a voice not of her own. Then her chair levitated and she was thrown across the room. Yeah, just zipping around the house, floating around on a chair like the Jetsons? Yeah, no thank you, that's like haunted, haunted. Just bulldoze that thing, would you? Number four, deep sea pigs. All right, we'll bring it back up to some scary sea stuff. These guys are a genus of sea cucumber, but they have these little tube-like legs, which is why they look super weird and scary. Not that regular sea cucumbers look exceptionally normal, these ones look even weirder than that of regular ones, so gotta include them. They like to live on the seafloor, where they move through the sediment, searching for their next meal. They eat, check this out, they eat by extracting tiny little particles of organic matter that's just fallen from the surface of the ocean. Yeah, they just wait around for scraps to, again, just land on them. How sad is that? It's kind of funny, but it's mostly sad. Sea pigs measure out to be four to six inches long. So yeah, I guess they're cute, sure, I guess. They're small, so therefore cute. I'll admit it, they're okay to look at. And they live at a depth of somewhere between 1,200 to 5,000 meters deep, so I don't have to worry about any of these sea pigs grabbing my own little piggies, right? They're quite deep, so therefore out of sight, out of mind. They are small, but they're mighty. Their skin carries a natural poison, which can make them a horrible midnight snack for anyone involved. Also, when brought up closer to the surface, they literally disintegrate. So, that's a scary fact to know about an animal. Number three. Flushing. Okay, we're making some ground here. We got toilet paper, we got something for the smell. So now where do we put it? Well, plumbing and flushing wasn't connected to each house like it is today. See, the Greeks and Romans had it down to a science. They built drainage systems and learned from the ancient Mesopotamian people how to exactly deal with the problem of waste. A system of pipes, tubes, and drains. The bathroom problem seemed like an easy solution. Use gravity downhill to dispose of the waste outside the city. And here's the kicker. It can even be reused and repurposed at the end as an irrigation system, further nurturing the farming of crops. No, that's good. No, no, he's right. And then it disappears and literally goes downhill again. After the Roman Empire had fallen, this European dark sanitation era had begun, and hygiene sort of just 
slipped away. People weren't really concerned with things like disease and plague and instead leaned into real science like witchcraft or burning cats for fun. You know, important stuff. It wasn't until about the mid 1850s where people revisited this age old problem and recreated and did exactly the same thing science we already knew. Things were unnecessarily stinky for way too long. It wasn't until the British colonies started tinkering in Boston around the 1700s that proper piping and toiletry transport was eventually built and catalogued. Thus was born the first sanitation system again. And we still see it today, thank God. Number two, Tomb KV55. Classic, going back to Egypt for our Bumblebee fans. Located in the Valley of Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise KV55, was discovered by Edward Arton back in 1907. And the reason we call this tomb by a number rather than a name is because, well, we don't know who or what exactly was inside. Even the walls inside of it, they aren't like other tombs, covered in ancient hieroglyphs or, you know, art or anything nice. No, this time, there's nothing here. The only hint that remains is one hieroglyph. And it's scary, it translates to, the evil one shall not live again. Even these massive stones were built in order to prevent anything from getting out of the tomb. Yeah, out of the tomb. Usually with ancient tombs in history, it's the opposite. Things are, you know, prevented to get grave robbers to come in. This time they're like, no, 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 we don't want anything getting out. That's kind of haunting. Many believe that it's Akhenaten because he got on the wrong foot with uh, you know, the high priests over 17 years of ruling. He was convincing everybody that their art and religion was wrong. And the only God in existence was his sun God. So his own son, King Tut, succeeded him and luckily restored the previous religion back to normal. But yeah, maybe that's why this tomb is empty. Maybe they're like, you know what? We don't want history to remember you. You tried to out religion, so we're good. Number one, house guest. I saved the best for last, and by that I mean this is the scariest thing I've ever seen. This video, yep, little surprise for you, there we go. This comes from a middle-aged man in Oxford, North Carolina. It was his day off of work and he was looking forward to just kicking back, relaxing, and instead he had to deal with this. Instead, the lights in his home started to flicker, and immediately after, the smoke detector started to go off. The lights were flickering all over the house, not just one room. The fridge light, the bathroom light, you name it. The water even started to run by itself. So something started to go wrong, apparently. And he filmed the happenings, but when he looked back in the footage, you know, after fleeing his home on his only day off, he caught this peeking from the other room when looking back. Pretty terrifying, right? Yeah. Number 10, demonic boy photo. All right, scary as hell right off the hop. It doesn't matter where or when, but odds are you've seen this photo at some point in your life. It's pretty haunting. It's kind of hard to forget. Check it out. You know when you see a photo, sometimes you just get bad vibes, like it registers in your brain as something real and scary. You want to find something about this photo that looks fake, but it's hard. This photo here was taken inside the Amityville house back in 1976, the real house. It appears to be a young boy with glowing white eyes. Kind of, kind of hard to forget. It was taken with automatic cameras equipped with infrared, so nobody actually took this themselves, it was just set up. It makes it even creepier that the boy looks like he's peeking around the corner. Makes my heart race just looking at that photo right there. A photographer named Gene Campbell operated this and got this photo. See, Gene was working with paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren at this time, the famous duo, now rocking the big screen Conjuring Universe. They were on this case in real life. This photo was then revealed three years later on the Merv Griffin Show. Imagine tuning in watching TV on the Merv Griffin Show and then all of a sudden you see the ghost of John DeFeo. That's nice. Yeah, many believe this is the ghost of one John DeFeo, one of the boys who lived there prior to that 1974 horrible event. We're still trying to cover this. What do you guys think? Elaborate hoax or perhaps this photo is one solid piece of evidence that the Amityville house was and still is indeed haunted. Number nine, Svalbard Vault. Over the pandemic, I spent a lot of time playing video games. Chris and I actually just talked about video games for like eight minutes straight before we click record, so that's pretty funny. Some of my favorite games always have a similar theme. They always have this post-apocalyptic feel. It's always just barren wasteland with like one dog as a survivor and you have to like go and eat scraps. Yeah, Fallout, it's a great game. There's shelters with survivors or even vaults. It's stressful, but it's engaging, right? Searching around. Now in real life, we do have a global seed vault and it's deep in the Arctic Circle on the island Spitsbergen. Now in this massive bunker that has since been deemed the Doomsday Vault, great name, really rolls off the tongue there. This is where humans will store food crops. It contains 100 million seeds. So if the earth all of a sudden, you know, gets wiped out or even if all the ice melts and it floods and everything goes to 
quickly, this vault will still be good to go. All that water that just, you know, flooded the rest of humanity will then regrow the earth with all of these seeds, ideally. It sounds like a fun, cute way to get humans to think about the future. You're like, hey, throw some seeds in, make a wish. But I'm concerned. Is there something we don't know? How soon is this gonna happen? Why is everybody involved in this little seed heist? Number eight, Pluto's Gate. Number eight, Pluto's Gate. It rhymes, what's up? Also known as the Gate to Hell. <sighs> Okay, that's horrifying. These runes discovered in Turkey back in 1965 are beautiful, but they're also cursed. Historians believe that the site is the ancient city of Hierapolis, and if you're thinking about visiting these eerie ruins, well, you better leave the family pet at home. Yet yeah, any and all animal that enters these ruins, they also meet instant death. Sparrows were tossed in, and then they immediately stopped breathing, and they dropped. This was horrifying vocals, so they had to resort to science. Scientists have figured out the solution, and it's still pretty haunting. They measured the CO2 concentration and turns out while the sun is up, it burns away the gas, but at night, when the temperature drops significantly, the CO2 becomes heavier than that of air. Then it creates this deadly gas cloud on the floor, and then when the sun rises back up again, the concentration of CO2 hits 35%, so it's deadly enough for animals and sometimes even humans. Yeah, just stay away from anything called the gates of hell. How about that? It's pretty sound advice just to play it safe, huh? Then. Number seven, nursing home spirit. Also, we're gonna throw in some ghosts in this list, so again, hope those lights are dimmed. This photo was taken from a nursing home resident the same night another resident had passed away and they had no idea. This was back in 2015. That night, they heard a door open and close out in the hallway, but no visitors were allowed there at the time, so they noted it. It was, you know, a little odd. So there's a great amount of people who thinks that this image here is one of two things. One, the spirit of the resident that sadly passed away, or two, it could be the Grim Reaper. Yeah, how scary is that? Both terrible options. A few comments were saying how it's comforting to know that in the end, you aren't alone and, you know, an entity or something will walk you to the other side. I disagree. I think it's uh, terrifying. I'd rather die alone than have this dude break into my home and then walk me to the afterlife. I don't want any Grim Reaper. Thank you. Check out this photo. What do you think? Is this real or is this fake? Comment down below. Number six, the gates of Guinea. Another bad portal to another bad place. The souls of the dead have to go somewhere. And depending on your beliefs, that somewhere could either be beautiful, it could be peaceful, or it could be um, absolutely terrifying. Who knows, one of the three. In the world of voodoo, that place is an underworld called the Gates of Guinea. And here is the front door. Yeah, located in Louisiana, this tomb, that of voodoo priestess Marie Labio, is apparently the entrance to these deep waters, this twilight realm. And some voodoo followers try and open these gates to access the souls of the deep. And apparently the goal after that point would be to use the dead almost like zombies, like your own little personal zombie army. So that's horrible, I guess. Number five. The Great Stink, um, the what, what? Oh, no, 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 yeah, I read that right. The Great Stink of 1858 was an event in central London in the summer, during which the hot weather exaggerated and amplified the smell of untreated human waste and gunk that had washed up on both in and on the banks of the River Thames. The problem had been growing for years with an out-of-date technology and overflowing sewage system that emptied directly into the river. The stank was thought to have been the root cause of a number of contagious diseases and three outbreaks of cholera before it was agreed upon that a small problem was emerging. You think? Long story short, all the garbage, human waste, bloated bodies were all just washing up around the same time. Hey, I caught one. No, oh, that's an arm. Okay. And just cooking in all that sun all day? I know what August feels like, and I've smelt my garage and garbage day, and I can't imagine the smell already in central London at that time. And for people to have complained so much that it was even stinkier, that's absolutely rotten. Number four, ghost pilot. Oh, this one gives me the absolute creeps. I'm hoping it's just a friendly ghost, but really, you never know. I never know. I don't know. I don't want anything to do with any ghost, but sometimes they're friendly, apparently. Any sort of spirit, I don't welcome. There, I said it. The ghost pilot is a photograph that shows a spirit from 1987, when a woman named Mrs. Sayer was visiting an airfield in England. So of course she did the tourist thing and she got a photo in the cockpit, as we all do. Especially now, if you're seeing Top Gun, I'd be like, yo, get a photo of me. But while you're sitting in there getting that tourist photo, do you ever think of who may have sat there before? It's kind of creepy, right? People swear the Titanic was a cursed ship and that spirits were responsible for the ship's bad luck. I personally believe it was the iceberg, but you know, I'm open. Next time you want to sit in the pilot seat, look around for spirits. This image was developed and it appears somebody or something is in the helicopter with Mrs. Sayer. Yeah, nothing like finding out after, eh? Oh. Number three. 
A haunting in Connecticut. Based on all real case and point, a 2009 gem. The accounts of the horrific case of the Snedekers who moved into a ghost infested house in Connecticut, unknowingly moving into one of the most sinister haunted funeral homes on earth. At first, mom notices items missing, but that's just the start. Then the children started to see strange people in their home, and then their son started to act a little strange. Violent outbursts, physical attacks on his own family, Maybe he was becoming the next victim to the house's grim history. After months of scary stuff going on, the Warrens were finally called in and turned out the morticians that had lived there previously had practiced some abysmally sinister acts on some lifeless bodies, deepening the home into the hell it was now sold as. An exorcism or two later, and the house finally became a home again. The case can be reimagined in 2009's Haunting in Connecticut, where the story follows the story drawn out by the Snedekers all those sinister years ago. Yo, Taylor gets possessed, I'm swinging immediately. You know what I mean? Like so many holy hands right away, just. Number two, The Paris Catacombs. As above, so below is an underrated horror film. It's very good. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Makes you all sweaty and not nice. In the movie, a team of explorers accidentally go too deep when exploring the Paris Catacombs, and in turn, they have to face their own hellish nightmare. I'm not gonna give anything away. Well, this is not too far-fetched, it seems. In what feels like a never-ending maze, the tunnels underneath Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. See, originally, the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, it turned into something a a little more haunting. Cemeteries at this point in history were starting to fill up, and I mean that in a literal sense, like bodies. It was gross, we didn't know what to do, right? Humans didn't figure out the cleanliness thing for a while, so bodies would be laying on the side of the road. So the solution here was to use these catacombs, right? These tunnels have been there for centuries, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean arguably the scariest basement in the world. Just walls of skulls. What could possibly go wrong? So haunted, never going there, so haunted. Do you live in Paris? Have you seen this? Has anyone actually been down there? I wanna hear your account. Comment down below, because that's a scary movie, man. That's really not great. And finally, number one, Chernobyl. One of the greatest nuclear disasters ever in history. On April 26, 1986, reactor number four at the Chernobyl power complex exploded due to unstable and low power levels. Reactor four had been shut down a day before due to maintenance, and the next day at 1.23 a.m., radioactive debris compiled the fuel and reactor components just rained down all over the building. It's a nightmare scenario. Toxic fumes were carried from the wind and after just four months, 28 workers had died due to radiation exposure. Eventually, they had to evacuate over 100,000 residents, and to this day, that zone is a no-go. Reactor 4 will stay highly radioactive for another 20,000 years, so no time soon. Let's not head back there anytime soon. Number 10, Cursed Trumpets. King Tut's trumpets are a pair that were found in the burial chamber of the 18th Dynasty Pharaoh upon discovery. One silver and one bronze. The oldest operational trumpets in the world and the only known surviving examples from ancient Egypt. Both are engraved with images of the gods and both were silent for more than 3,000 years before the trumpets were played for 150 million people live on a BBC broadcast in 1939. And then World War II happened. Yeah, because apparently the curator of the Tut collection at the Egypt Museum says whenever they're played, a war occurs. Yeah. The bronze trumpet was stolen from the museum in Cairo during the looting riots of 2011, and then hilariously enough, returned two weeks later. Yeah, apparently Buddy didn't like the ancient gods just roaming his condo. Uh, you think? Number nine. Annabelle, the most infamous and dangerous possessed doll in the world. Yeah, pretty well all you need to know about that. Found at the home of the Warren's Occult Museum in Connecticut, we know a little bit about this doll with all the films about her. She rests inside a glass case marked warning, positively do not touch. Aggressive, but necessary. Gifted to a nursing student from a thrift store in the 70s, incidents involving levitating onto the table and running around at night she took the doll to a medium who said it was possessed by a little girl who had passed. Ed and Lorraine were called shortly after and they offered to take it to their home. On the way home, Ed said that the doll was making the car do funny things. Swerving, no power steering, brake checks, haunted, haunted, yeah. The museum unfortunately shut down in 2019 but the cursed objects seem to be staying put which the owners even refuse to make eye contact with. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I would definitely Ronaldo that thing across the room if it was running around my apartment 2 a.m. Just field goal it right out the window. Number eight, 
Travis Walton. The horrifying abduction of Arizona forester Travis Walton. This is my favorite alien abduction case, yet the scariest, hands down. Fire in the Sky, filmed in 1993, does a pretty bang up job at what happened that night. In 1975, Walton and a logging crew were working in the National Forest. Him and six of his co-workers encountered a saucer-shaped craft feet away from their truck making a high-pitched tone. The curious Walden was then blasted by a light beam and apparently abducted into their ship. The men were terrified and drove off immediately. Walden claims that he then woke up in a hospital room on board, observed by three short bald creatures, before fighting tirelessly and losing consciousness. He remembers nothing else until he found himself awake walking along a highway five days later, naked, just wandering the highway in a daze. He's had tons of interviews, guy was definitely taken. He's also so peaceful about it too. He's just convinced that they tried to heal him from the accidental blast. I check your organs and your pineal gland. Just make sure they're all there and intact, you know? Holy moly. Number seven, teeth. Invented in 1488 by Sir Robert Tooth. Okay, I'm joking, no. Teeth were never officially invented, but what we did for them and how we cared for them had people scratching their heads for the last millennia. We've all had a toothache at some point in our lives, so they must have had them back then. In fact, oral hygiene was utterly disgusting. I didn't brush my teeth after my coffee and I can already feel it. Ew. People's teeth were so bad throughout history that dentists were actually training and teaching each other what to do about the huge toothworm problem. That's right. Imagine worms growing inside your teeth. Well, due to the swelling and pressure, people thought there were actual bugs or evil spirits living within their sore tooth, serving them extreme pain. Nope, just an infection. You need a root canal. Oh, and actual worms and bugs living in the tooth. Uh, yeah, you see this gray area right here? Uh, that's a ladybug, right? It's medieval England and things were pretty medieval. Right down to the surgery, and if you had an impacted wisdom tooth, well, that wasn't covered. England, 400 AD. People started this new trend of oral hygiene cleaning, but it wasn't spin brushes and floss, no more like mint and vinegar and prayer. Just kind of swoosh it all around in your mouth and wipe your teeth with your shirt and call it another year. If you were lucky enough to rinse your mouth out at the time, then you could have saved yourself a visit to the medieval dentist chair. Well, actually just a slab of rock you sit up against and have a friend who's good at ripping. And there you go, buddy. Hey, wake up. The infection alone from the dirty tools going into your mouth is making me itchy. I feel like my breath stinks more now after I've read this topic. Anybody have any gum? Number six, Osiris. Yet again, something stolen that's very, very old. Why do people steal the oldest, most cursed stuff? The infamous statue of Osiris. In 1971, during an excavation in Saqqara, Egyptologist Walter Brian Emery found a small statue of the Egyptian god of death, Osiris. Emery took the statue of Osiris and once at his house, Emery went to the bathroom to shower. After a few moments, apparently his assistant heard Emery screaming in fear. He found him clutching the sink, scared to death and paralyzed. Emery was diagnosed with paralysis of the right side of his body and was unable to speak. He died the following day. Uh, yeah, talk about a curse of the pharaohs. Like, buddy, you can't just steal stuff and then just throw it up overseas in a museum. Especially the stuff that clearly says in hieroglyphics, do not remove, this is cursed. It's pretty clear right there. Like, never steal anything ancient, you know? That's just a scary movie like waiting to happen. Number five, The Shining Hotel Spirit. The Stanley Hotel in Colorado is now of course quite famous for its use in the Stanley Kubrick 1980 classic, The Shining. The lodge, being over 100 years old, has a pretty decent chance of being haunted in real life. So the spirit tours that happen there pack a punch for fans of the production and also fans for the paranormal. Jay Mosling was on one of these tours, so like any ghost expert would do, they snapped a few photos of random corners of the room. Gotta catch those ghosts with the flash, it's the only way. After the trip, he was going through set photos and he found this gem. It appears to be a spirit, a demon, a ghost, an apparition, something. Something that's see-through and floating, so scary. It also has long black hair, it appears, so yeah, I don't know what's going on there. The room was of course empty at the time the photo was taken, and I do believe that. There's no way you could just snap random photos of people and be like, oh, I was looking for ghosts, sorry. <laughs> no, that's illegal, you can't do that. Number four. The Ring. One ring to rule them all. The Vine Ring, aka the Ring of Silvianus, is a gold ring from the 4th century AD. The ring was discovered on a farm in 1785 in England. 
First, the property of a British Roman named Silvianus. Apparently, it was stolen by a person named Senecianus, upon which Silvianus hexed the ring with a curse. In 1929, during excavations of the site, archaeologists discovered the now curse that goes with said ring, consulting shortly after with one J.R.R. Tolkien. Mm. The band of the ring has 10 edges. Among it is the goddess Venus engraved, along with the words, live in God. The lore goes, Silvianus's ring was stolen by someone named Senecianus. Silvianus created and hexed a tablet, which he wrote, for the god Nodens. Silvianus has lost a ring that has donated one half of its worth to Nodens. Among those named Senecianus, permit no good health until it's returned to the temple of Nodens. Yeah, that sounds like a spell to me, dude. And Noden is like Poseidon, so you don't want any of that smoke. Number three, the specter of Newbie Church. This one comes from 1963, so it's a little more recent, but even so, this is one of the most convincing on this list, in my humble opinion. Reverend KF Lord took this photo in the Newbie Church in England. England's a hot spot for ghosts, eh? Damn. And Lord ensures us that this photo is 100% real. I mean, to be fair, it looks like the spirit is facing the camera, so I don't know. It's a great frame, but I'm still believing. The whole Plague Doctor vibe going on here, that's what makes me feel gross here. Anything with Plague Doctors is always giving me the creeps, so I can't even look at this photo. The figure seems to be standing on the first step to the altar, yet somehow it is still taller than the actual altar itself. We think this being, this ghost, is about nine feet tall, so so whoever faked this, if that is the case, they must have been on stilts or something. Also, stilts and a sheet over your face on a staircase? I don't know. That's, I don't think anyone faked this. That's for sure a very tall demon. Drink your milk, then you'll be tall and strong in the afterlife, just like that demon right there. Number two, Statue of Lem. The Women of Lem statue was discovered in Lem, Cyprus in 1878 and dates back to about 3500 BCE. The statue earned the nickname the Goddess of Death after four different families experienced tragedy while possessing the carved stones. The first owner, along with his entire family, died within six years of owning the statue, all of mysterious and rapid illnesses. The other two owners also died, of course, along with their entire families, just a few short years after obtaining the statue. The fourth owner died alongside his wife and two daughters of mysterious causes while in possession of the rock. Now, a gift to the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh, it's encased in glass, safe, and unable to bear any other family bad omens. And number one, the mummy. My number one spot, of course, this is the most terrifying find of all. In 1991, a 5,000 year old frozen preserved human mummy was discovered in the frozen Otzel Apse of Italy. Otzi, of course, is the name the researchers chose to name this mummy for obvious location reasons. Otzi, though, is believed to have been murdered before being frozen in time due to the discovery of an arrowhead embedded in his left shoulder, various wounds on his body, and also the blood soaked tunic he's wearing with multiple people's DNA on it. Maybe in combat, maybe from megafauna. Who knows? Scientists believe that he's the oldest known naturally preserved mummy on Earth. This is where it's gonna get spooky. Once unearthed, a curse surfaced too, and grew stronger as people linked to him began to die one after another in violent freak accidents. So far, seven deaths have been tied or related to Otzi's dethawing, including forensic pathologist who was killed in a car accident en route to give a speech about Otzi, a mountaineer in an avalanche, a hiker who discovered the Iceman falling down a treacherous path, the molecular archaeologist was found dead in his home, the head of the forensic team had a heart attack, another discoverer died of a sudden brain tumor, and another of multiple sclerosis. Yo, say what you will about curses, when people start dropping all involved with the find, I'd say it's probably the 5,000 year old mummy you just found. You think? And hey, coming in at number 10, baths. From bath bombs to jacuzzis, when did people exactly start warming up that cold river water to sit in for some R&R? &R? Well, apparently the Romans were the first to think about warming her up. I don't really know if they had it in mind that warm water works better and faster to clean and rid of microparticles and had more of a oh, mentality, but one way or another they did it. Were they really ahead of their time though? The first bathhouses have been discovered in Rome approximately being built somewhere in the second century BC. The first of its kind from a river of cold water to the abundance of over 500 steaming prominent bathhouses. You could pamper yourself head to toe for a small price, small enough so that even the poorest could bathe. 
That's a lot of small business owners. Hottest water in town, step right up, step right up. The Romans came up with an idea to build a spa house thing which could be flooded and heated by the floor beneath it. With a giant fireplace inside the spa, it was lit by hand and blown through the vents under the floor. Damn, they were smart, huh? Hot and steamy and good for the body. And clean. Well, cleaner. The bathhouse was a technology of its own and it seemed like humanity was headed in the right direction. No, no they were not. Number nine, wiping. Do as the Romans did. It's thought that these people thought of literally everything before us. Oh yeah? How about pogo sticks, think of that? Huh? pogo -onitis? No, no you didn't. Look that up, did they? Over the years I've had some pretty jobs, but nothing as as this one. Literally. Uh, sire, would you like fronteth to backeth or backeth to fronteth today, sire? That's right, there was a job for that. People had to have had started wiping at some point, right? But who exactly and when? The groom of the stool, chief gentlewoman of the privy chamber. Call it whatever you like, we know what they did. So what exactly did they wipe with? Well, usually hay, sticks, fur, or even seashells. Every single one of those sounds itchy and terrible. I know what Charmin can do sometimes, and I can't imagine what a piece of oak could have done back then. Was there splinter taker routers as well? I can't help but feel although how painful and stinky it was, I'm sure there was at least one shared laugh, a little quality time spent with some royalty to say the least. Although this career is speculated, both King Charles I and King James I had them, so unless they decided they wanted to do that after them, someone must have continued doing it. I hope for a pretty penny at least. Those waste management dudes have pretty good benefits. Filing your taxes, looking for a job description. Uh, ah, yes, here it is, wiper. Number eight, urine. Okay, is this just gonna be disgusting the entire time? Well, the answer is yes. History's pretty disgusting. Okay, this one is weird because right when we think we figured it all out, something jarring happens, like a jar of piss and all the health benefits it had throughout history. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Well, at least they thought it did. In ancient Rome, not only was this liquid gold sold for, well, gold, it was often traded as a prominent good, sold for its multitude of healing purposes. You see, people have been using urine for thousands of years. That's right, this destructive, toxic bodily fluid could be repurposed, salvaged into many different topicals and treatments. From hair loss to your daily skincare routine, it was not only great for staining and softening leather made for shoes and clothes, it was a natural teeth whitener, an antiseptic. <laughs> That's right, from ancient Rome to as late as the 20th century, people have been tinkering and tailoring with their pee. Egyptians did it, Greeks did it. Urine is the body's natural antiseptic and was soon turning septic. Like the science behind this alone is what your buddy tells you, you know what I mean? Oh, rolled ankle? Yeah, yeah, just piss on it. Got ghosts? Ah, eh, just pee on it. The ailment for all your needs. Disgusting. Number seven, werewolves of London. Real werewolves. In the 80s, Lorraine and Ed Warren traveled in search of a real life wolf man. Apparently they were watching a TV show following the life of a local werewolf, Bill Ramsey in London, England, and Lorraine felt a strange connection to him. After a quick trip to London for more answers, she found Bill's whereabouts. Unlike usual werewolf folklore, he didn't transform every full moon and he didn't get bit. Bill Ramsey was apparently possessed by an evil wolf spirit. That's right. It was so bad that he needed a full-blown exorcism. The Warrens brought Bill back to Connecticut to meet Bishop Robert McKenna, and the exorcism was a success. Thanks to everyone involved that day, Bill lives a pretty normal life now, very unpossessed. Yeah, I'd hope so. This is terrifying. Imagine that's your neighbor. Yeah, sometimes I change into a werewolf once in a blue moon. I'm Bill, nice to meet you, welcome to the neighborhood. This is a fruitcake. Number six, toilet paper. Finally, something we recognize. Invented originally in China in 851 from the Tang Dynasty, these soft fabric sheets were designed for, well, you know what it was designed for, but yes, mostly the emperor's bathroom breaks and soon caught on for the commonwealth as well. The higher the class, the softer and more luxurious the material. From leather to silk, butts were seeing a kinder, gentler side of hygiene. Two ply bark versus four ply silk. The use of toilet paper throughout Europe is a messy one. Again, wipers and hay and stuff like that. It wasn't until the toilet paper rule created by Joseph Gaiety in 1857 that this hygiene method would solidify and stay for keeps. The classic under versus over is the tale as old as time. You ever wanna get into a quick argument at someone's house? Just peek in the loo, see if they're rocking beard or mullet. It's the simplest way to have a know-it-all show you the patent and tell you how to wipe your own Charmin. 
Number five, backseat driver. This photo here is from 1959, and it certainly looks like it. It was taken by a lady named Mabel Chinnery, and the photo, at first glance, is just a classic 60s shot of a man in a car. That man was Mabel's husband. Now, the man in the back seat, however, we have no idea who that is. Apparently they weren't there in real life. Her husband was the only one in the car at that time. And also, that's a pretty tough angle. If you wanted to recreate this photo with your friends after work, it would be hard. You have to really line something up there. Some Edgar Wright shot has to happen, you know what I mean? It's like he's appearing to us through the seat almost. So either this is a lie, and there was indeed a man sitting in the back left seat, or like Mabel believes, this is her dead mother-in-law. Now if she had said father-in-law, I would think maybe it's a spirit, but this for sure looks like an older man with a so we don't know. A lot of ghosts just like to hang around. Honestly, Mabel, just see a priest, just to be safe. Number four, nose gaze. I was just thinking, where are all these inventions and blueprints on how to stop the smell? If you can knit metal into a crop top, you can cover your mouth and nose, can't you? Well, close enough. Nose gaze were invented. Basically just big nose plugs one would wear day to day to drown out the smell of absolute filth. Just plug it up and ignore it was their mentality. A makeshift wad of bunched up herbs and flowers shoved up your nose, blocking the nasal cavity from the stank that followed. Just see number five. A poo-pourri for each nostril. Would this make things worse, ignoring the smell? Wouldn't that make it even harder to find out where it's coming from? Nope, just band-aid it. It's gonna disappear on its own. We're humans, we're designed to smell stuff for our own survival. The smell is like what lets us know not to go down there. Oh, no, no. Like, wouldn't everything just smell like roses at that point? These people were trying to avoid the stinky streets because that actually meant that's where the infection and disease was actually hanging out. The blind leading the blind. Number three, underneath Thwaites Glacier. We've seen some fascinating stuff here on Bumblebee, specifically underwater creatures and haunting stuff from our past. We love exploring the depths, and this next one, I couldn't believe it's actually terrifying to look at. This is footage from the bottom of an Antarctic glacier. This glacier is the size of Florida. If it collapses, our sea levels could rise 10 feet, so it's a pretty big deal. So scientists were like, yeah, let's drill a hole through the middle of it and see what happens. Yeah, in 2019, researchers drilled 2,300 feet right through the middle of the Thwaites Glacier, and they dropped a robot with the camera down, and they saw this. This is the first time we've seen the grounding zone of Thwaites Glacier. Lead scientist Brittany Schmidt says this project is a dream come true. And for me, it's a nightmare that I now have to look at. I don't wanna watch this video ever again, but you should, it's pretty cool. Number two, disinfectants. How did people exactly know if something was clean or not? They couldn't have just seen the particles back then. Let's hear a chamber pot. It smells clean. People were plugging their noses so they couldn't even smell anything. They couldn't smell if it was clean or not. There certainly wasn't a demand for a fresh lemon scent that we're all used to. This was the birth of some basic antiseptic. Chemists were mixing and mashing chemicals and a new form of cleaning agent was introduced in the 1890s by German chemist science Gustav Rappenstrauch in hopes to rid the country of the overflowing cholera epidemic and seize the spread of germs and the disease. By mixing benzalkonium and hydrogen peroxide, you were left with a chemical compound that would destroy and clean infections on medical patients. Light bulb. Thus leaning towards the direction of an all-purpose surface cleaner, killing bacteria and ridding the area of harmful toxins. And drum roll please, Lysol was created. That's right, the same Lysol we use today. This was a push in the right way for humanity. An easy to use liquid cleaner that would aid disinfecting everything in its way. I've seen the bottle and the Wemyss labels. Must have been even stronger back then too. Hope no one spilled it on themselves in testing. Ooh, ouch, that is a class one chemical burn. <laughs> You're just gonna wanna pee on that for 12 to 13 days. And number one, soap. Finally, the end of all our ailments. Soap, the answer. Well, not really. See, it's been around since the Romans because they literally did everything before us and stop bragging, we get it. Made out of animal fats, ash, and mostly lye, these makeshift balls of soap were invented years ago and then forgotten, and then invented again, and then forgotten again. Cleanliness was loose, remember, and it was almost uncool to believe in science, and it wasn't really until the mass production of this chemical detergent that it really stuck. Soap was predominantly sold, produced, and commercialized in the late 1800s. By this time, scientists were fiddling around with things like Lysol and more chemical compounds, sparking its way to the study of germs, a vital step towards large-scale soap production, and it actually started in 1791 when a French chemist, Nicolas Leblanc, patented a system for making soda ash from salt, at which point added with animal fat, and there you have it. The slippery bar we're all used to today. 
The discovery made soap making one of America's fastest growing industries in 1850. And it seemed from then on in it was only up. It's crazy to think that someone at this time, even after soap was invented, were still spit shining surgical instruments to be clean. 